filming outside today might be a mistake because I am sneezing like crazy, but as is typical for this channel, we're just gonna go with it. Today, I am going to talk to you about this absolutely amazing book that I finished recently and that I almost didn't read. Like, I almost took this off my TBR list. To begin with, it was kind of put on my TBR list on a whim when I saw it in a secondhand shop. And oh my god, I am so glad that I read this because it literally might be like the best historical fiction that I've ever read. Almost certainly also one of the best anti-colonialist texts that I've ever read. I mean, it's a masterpiece. Yet more evidence of my thesis that books are simply not meant to be churned out in a year, as the publishing companies currently kind of force people to do a lot, or as a lot of people feel obligated to do. I think that this book is the perfect example of what 12 years of just research can do for a book. The book in question is Aztec by Gary Jennings. The author to write this lived in Mexico for 12 years and it shows, like it really really shows. I'm just gonna talk about this today, um, I'm gonna tell you about a little bit of background on the book um, as I've started to give already, why I recommend it and uh, then just overall thoughts on what I think this demonstrates and shows for the writing process as I personally see it. So yeah, so I initially picked this up because I had never read any like adult fiction set in the Aztec Empire. Um, at its height, obviously. Honestly, I don't think I've, re I've read any fiction at all that was set in this time and certainly not something this extensive. Like this, I feel like typically in historical fiction when indigenous societies appear it is normally as kind of like a side thing, like it's always like a side subject. And this intrigued me because not only did it centralize uh, an indigenous culture, it also was clearly giving it like a lot of attention. Like it's not like this is some 300 page whatever that this guy wrote after you know however much research he clearly like completely like threw himself into this the author of this is somewhat mysterious i haven't been able to find out a lot about him he only has a couple of novels they're all historical fiction um all about relatively obscure historical fiction subjects i mean he's got one that's about marco polo but as far as like contemporary historical fiction goes, I feel like Marco Polo isn't talked about that much. So yeah, so, and all of them are this big. Um, so he is definitely a research guy and he likes long form narrative, which is what I like too. Like my current novel project, I have chapters that are coming in at like 15,000 words, which I know you're not supposed to do, but Sometimes you just have a lot to say and it just the fat can't be trimmed. One of the feedbacks I always got in my first novel is that like, well not that I always got, but this is one comment that really stood out to me from an agent and he said, well you've over edited this. I didn't know you could do that. I thought the whole point of modern publishing was to make everything as small and convenient and efficient as possible and that apparently is not true. This. I love it because it's so inefficient and it is so detailed. So yeah, I mean the author lived in Mexico for 12 years to write this and it really shows in the language, honestly. Um, all of- his main character doesn't even just have one name. Like the main name that uh, belongs to the main character who we follow for the entirety of this, so we're not following side characters, it's all the main guy. His name is Nixtli, but he also has a bunch of other names, like some of them are like rude nicknames he's given as a child and 
some of them are like particular extra titles that he is given when he accomplishes something. Others are given to him when he is in foreign lands of like neighboring tribes. So much research was done that you get that kind of depth of detail. And even like the other nations like have different you can just tell that the names sound different and that he like was really paying attention to the nuances of like the culture and language of each place he doesn't whitewash any of the names at least like it I could be wrong, but it seemed like he did, didn't, and you might be like, well, why is the title Aztec then? It's interesting, but we actually don't hear the word Aztec used until the very end of the book when it's being used by the Spanish. All up until then we get like the traditional name Azteca. You are probably getting the idea from like the way I'm talking about this that it is really, really complicated. and. It is. Like, it's a really complicated swooping narrative and the level of detail that's given, like, I know that I could read this multiple times and get a ton of enjoyment out of it because there are so many just like minute cultural details that he offers to us. It's not efficient. It's not everything is like meaningful to like the actual like plot. The kind of thesis of this novel is that Nixley is charged by the gods or his mission in life is to observe because he is told that like history is going it's going to take a very sharp turn in his lifetime and that his job is to observe it all as it happens. He suffers a great deal of loss throughout this novel but it's not only a personal narrative so this book is kind of divided into sections. So the first part of this is personal narrative. So this whole thing follows Mixley as he ages. So the first part is very personal, very centrally located in like his part of town. It is when he's a child and when he's an adolescent. So early sexual experiences, spending time with his father, family drama, interpersonal drama, stuff like that. There is one particular scene in this that I adored so much, at least in this part of the novel, where uh, Mixley goes to the early morning market with his father and they're like looking at all the vendors and it's his birthday. Uh, and so his father treats him to the most expensive thing in the market, which is a snow cone. And you may be wondering how the hell did they have that? Well, apparently, at least as it's written in this, the vendor of the snow cones has his slaves or his servants run all the way up to the top of the mountain peak that is nearest, <laughs> nearest by, grab snow, and run it all the way back down in time for the morning market and he sells it. And of course, because it's so fragile and it is gonna be gone by midday, it's super, super expensive. But uh, Mixley gets one and they pour some kind of sweet syrup over the top of it and it literally is like a modern snow cone. I just thought that was super sweet and I honestly would not have a hard time believing that that was a real thing that existed uh, in, uh, places that had access to like a mountain peak nearby, you know, people find a way to have their their little treats um, And so yeah, so the, that's what the first part of this is that snow cone anecdote is very cute I will say this novel is Not for the faint of heart like it has so much shit in it that we would consider taboo. If you can't handle Lolita, you will not be able to handle this book. And I don't want to make it sound like he tries super hard to make like ancient Aztec culture seem super shocking or anything because um, I didn't really get the feeling that it was that. By framing this narrative as Mixley's observations that he is recounting to the Spanish Empire, um, which is how it's framed from the very beginning. He's basically captured by the Spanish Empire and tasked with recounting information about his life so that they can learn more about the Aztec Empire. By framing it that way, it, it does kind of make it seem more like just like a bald recounting of experiences and actual true human experience is not always 
PC. Like, it's just not. When you live a full life, there are things that will happen to you and that you will encounter and perhaps even do yourself that don't fit into that kind of narrative. And I think that that's part of the reason why I liked this so much, because it felt so full of experiences. The highs were so high and the lows were so low. Like, there was one particular scene in the earliest part of this book regarding Mixley's sister and something which happens to her. It was so gut-wrenching and horrifying. It was probably one of the most disturbing things I've ever read, honestly. But oh, it was so good though, because it was vivid. And that's like the biggest thing about this book is that it is it's a vivid, like, it feels like a real dip into ancient Aztec uh, life. And yeah, I mean, I also liked that they weren't trying to make Mixley into, like, a perfect person. Because he's not. Like, he is an extremely complicated character. And honestly, I need to read this again to try to kind of, like, feel him out a little bit more. Um, because... I find him super interesting. I mean, he is like an observer character, so he doesn't have like a super, super duper strong personality, but he does definitely have a personality and at times he is really an unreliable narrator because Mixley also has prejudices towards other neighboring like indigenous nations. So he really doesn't like the Maya and he doesn't respect them. Um, and honestly, I thought it was super interesting to read about it from that perspective. You never get these kind of fully fleshed out portraits of like indigenous characters. I should mention, I guess Mixley also is is technically disabled. He has something wrong with his eyes. I think it's just meant to be ordinary myopia, but he is technically, like, at least in this society, he is, like, a disabled character, and he's often mocked for that. We have this personal section, right? And then we get into a war section where he joins the military. He has that, right? He has his military experience. Then, after that section, we have a traveling merchant section where he decides, okay, I'm kind of done being in the military. I want to give being a traveling merchant a try. So he does that for, I would say, the majority of the book. And this is the part of the book that I found the most exciting because I loved reading about all the neighboring nations. Um, just because, like, I loved reading about the minute, like, differences in culture, differences in society, also kind of judging Mixley's prejudice a little bit because it, when it shines through, like it really shines and it's like very obvious that it's meant to be a tug in cheek. Like, you know, this is a person recounting this experience, not just a dictionary. There are maps in this. Um, my copy of it has not great maps. He goes, so he goes like all the way down here and all the way up here. So this is kind of the range of movement that you get and he encounters just countless people. Eventually he settles down and takes a wife but doesn't stop traveling in the process of that. Uh, his wife travels with him on one occasion and then in the last, I want to say, quarter of the book we get the invasion of the Spaniards. Uh, and everything that comes with that. I honestly found that the least enjoyable part of the book, to be honest. The most enjoyable parts of me were kind of just Mixley doing his thing and like um, the Spanish had not yet showed up. Um, I found that part of the book just to be kind of... It did literally feel like an intrusion. Like I, I was just annoyed that that had to be there and I knew it had to be there and I knew that that was the author's intent to make me feel intruded upon when they showed up. But that was how it felt and because of that it was just my least favorite part of the novel. This is such a just brilliant anti-colonialist text. I mean, Mixley is very kind of like, you know those people that can insult someone and they haven't realized they've been insulted? Mixley does that to the Spaniards who are taking notes on his uh, experiences quite often. Um, and it is quite funny sometimes. I think the other thing that I really liked is, um, and this is gonna be a really controversial opinion, but actually uh, one thing I was really worried about in this book was that the like treatment of women would be super, super abhorrent in it, like shock value rape and stuff like that. But honestly, it was extremely graphic, like probably 
I don't remember Game of Thrones super well. I think it actually might be worse than Game of Thrones. And there were particular scenes where I was like, the author might have been a little bit horny when he wrote this. But overall, I didn't really feel like, I, I couldn't really take umbrage with how it treated women. Like it just, it felt, it felt like I was there so much and it was so vivid and so realistic that I didn't really feel like it was egregious. But I don't know, I think that different people will have different reactions to this. I think if you are a person that like cannot stand scenes where like prostitution is treated as like normal and like just part of society or like human sacrifices and things like that if you like take issue with very graphic gory details of that kind of stuff it won't be for you i definitely am squeamish at that kind of stuff but i was able to suspend my disbelief for this because the writing was so good that it actually was like fine for me and i didn't take any issue with it yeah and i think just as an anti-colonialist tax normally it's like you're kind of like itching to see the culture clash. I didn't really feel like that in this one. I actually was kind of dreading the Spanish showing up a little bit and it actually really was like a buzzkill for me and I thought that was just like brilliant rhetoric. He literally like wove the anti-colonialist sentiments like into the actual structure of the narrative. He gave you so much vivid detail of the society up until this point that it does literally make you sympathetic to like the anti-colonialist like point of view by the time you get to the point where the Spaniards arrive. And you know, I mean, he does the typical thing, goes on and on about how, how disgusting the Spaniards were and all of that jazz. I think that's it. I think I definitely will be actually seeking out other stuff by this author. You definitely need to be in a particular mood to read it. Like you have to be in the mood for an absolute tome of a book. This is over a thousand pages. I think it's a thousand, a thousand thirty pages. So it took me quite a while to get through this. It does go very fast. There were times when I would just like knock out a hundred pages in one sitting because it was so enjoyable. There are sequels to this book. One of them was written by Jennings himself and the other ones were written by other people after he died. I myself feel like this is complete. Oh yeah, I forgot about this. He kind of like segues in like that Mixley has like a secret son at, on like literally the very last page. I was like, okay, those 12 years in Mexico cannot have been cheap. However, that wasn't necessary. Like, this is totally complete in itself. You don't have to commit to reading the whole series or whatever. Like, seriously, this can be just read as a standalone very easily. Yeah, so this absolutely is one of the best historical fiction books that I've ever read in my life. And to me, again, like, it really shows that in general, books need to be sat with and marinated like i don't think i no longer really respect authors that like crank out a book a year because every time i read a book like that it just feels incomplete like you're always gonna have books that are like cormac mccarthy's Lo the road where he just like is on drugs and he gets it out and it's like you know you have like a good finished product but for the most part i don't think that bo a book can be created in a month and i don't think that it can be created in a year and i think this is why the best authors are often independently wealthy or have some kind of day job supporting them because you have to sit with it you know the amount of effort that he put into this just fucking shows you couldn't write this you could not write this in a year you couldn't even write this in three years donna tart is another great example of this where you know she spends 10 years on each book and it shows so much and you know it's unfortunate for capitalism i think capitalism is going to keep trying to you know get people to crank out cheap books as fast as they possibly possibly can and like that's fine but don't ever let them convince you that the good shit gets done in a year <laughs> just 
that I don't believe in that anymore. I don't think that's how it works. I was at like a presentation last month or something like that and they were talking about historical fiction there and one of the the presenters was telling us all about one of her favorite new historical fiction novels and it's on my TBR now because it sounded so absolutely off the rails bonkers that I had to read it. It's called Memoirs of Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian, and she was telling us about this book and how it took the author like 40 years to write because she literally scrapped it four times and then got it right a fifth time. And what she would do, what this author would do, this author would lie in bed at night imagining that she was the Emperor Hadrian and then after a while of doing that and just vividly hallucinating and like slipping it literally slipping into his dead consciousness she would get up and she would write memoirs as if she was him. To me that kind of magic like that's what real writing is. I mean I feel like you have to there needs to be like a little bit of insanity in forming it. I don't think that you can just tap 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 grind it out for eight hours a day every single day, never have any life experiences, never go and touch grass and have a final product that turns out nice. Or I mean it might be nice but it won't be sublime. Yeah, I don't know. That's my soapbox for today. Please give this book a try. I know it's old. I know it's old. I know it's not shiny, but oh my god, the inside is so shiny. <laughs> not for the faint of heart, but so worth it if you are willing to give it a try. That's all I've got for you. Thanks for joining me outside, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.